today I'm talking about my the sort of work me and Thomas Devotney have been doing over the last year on efficiently training SNNs on GPUs. And my first problem, there we go. So there's a long history of uh, there's a long history of accelerating spiking neural network simulation in computational neuroscience. There have been lots of lots of simulators developed over the decades now, uh, which are very efficient in processing the sort of sparse connectivity and the sparse activity you see in um, in biological models. However, they kind of have a focus on simulating single instances of these models, so like large large models of uh, cortical columns, that type of thing. Um, and historically, distributed CPUs have been the platform of choice for this work. And these are not the tools that people want to use for machine learning anymore. Um, the, other, the other extreme of the sort of hardware platforms is neuromorphic hardware. We've had a lot of cool stuff about neuromorphic hardware this week. Um, and these systems have the potential to save thousands to millions millions of millions of times the energy compared to standard hardware but um although i've we've seen some talks especially yesterday about people overcoming these challenges and doing some really cool stuff online learning on these systems is still challenging and also uh, with the current kind of generation of gradient based data uh, gradient based learning algorithms they're very data hungry and real time is just not fast enough you need to train for multiple epochs and large data sets so you need to simulate many times faster than real time to make these approaches um, useful for real problems. So because of this, people have uh, started applying standard machine learning tools like PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX to uh, GPU accelerate spike neural network research. And these, in this this work, this this approach, people tend to basically treat an SNN as a recurrent neural network with binary activations. Um, this is this is. Uh, these tools are useful for this because you can add surrogate gradients um, or use the spike times from the output layer or something and then use auto differentiation to train the SNNs using backcrop through time. However, <clears throat> I'd like to argue that this is not a good way of representing an SNN. Um, under, the, under the hood, all of, these, all of these tools basically represent your computation as a graph. So if you have a if you have an example, sort of really simple two-layer spiking neural network, you've got some input tensor coming in at the bottom. Uh, you multiply this by a weight matrix. Then you you add this onto a voltage. You decay this for the multiplication, and you take a threshold to get the binary activation of the next layer. So this this approach works, uh, but there's several problems with it. So first of all, I first of all, as these are individual kernels for each of these sort of fairly low level operations uh, there's this each one adds latency to the to the to simulate in the model on a linux machine it's roughly 10 microseconds of latency and this is going to scale as the model gets deeper additionally because these are all kind of all individual kernels you need to write your results back to global memory between each operation which slows things down further um, so this this is bad because it scales it scales with the depth of the model as well. So the problem the latency problem gets worse, sort of more complex your model. Um, you can you can, uh, many libraries improve this by using either just in time compilation or custom kernels to sort of merge together all the kernels in this uh, in each for example simulating a neuron, and this does reduce the latency. So in this very small example, it halves the latency, but still the latency increases with the depth of the model, which is not great. Um, and also spike propagation is not matrix multiplication, at least theoretically, if you can harness it, it's just adding up the weights of the rows of the matrix where the spikes, which should be, as I say, if you can harness it, it should be much cheaper. So this brings me on to Gen, which is our C++ library for generating um, spiking neural network simulation codes. It's now got backends which can generate CUDA, OpenCL and C++ code. Um, and it's fully drivable from Python. There's no need to actually delve into the C++ unless you want to. Um, in the past, Gen has focused on computational neuroscience and neurorobotics applications. And you can see some of, this, some of the papers where we've explored these, these areas at the bottom of this slide. But um, from the beginning, Gen kind of had a maxim that the user should have maximum control. So you can kind of mess with everything and do um, a lot sort of more custom stuff than you can in a lot of simulators. So, we think this makes it a much better choice for for sort of the slightly different use cases of um, spike-based machine learning. And if you're interested, uh, you can check out our new homepage here, uh, which Thomas has recently made, and it's very shiny. So how do we implement SNNs in Gen? So it's, it's somewhat different. So we take advantage of the fact that spike transmission is not instantaneous. And this lets you break the dependency between the layers. 
So instead of having to have a different kernel for each each layer, you instead group together all the neuron kernels in one, simulate all the neurons at once, store all the spikes in it, and then simulate the spikes propagating through all the connections at once. So in our contrived example, this reduces the latency by a further half. And this this these overheads don't really change as you make a bigger model. The kernels just get bigger. And this this common this um this fusing is done uh, using an approach we describe in our 2021 paper, which hopefully minimize, minimizes the amount of code being being simulated and makes everything really efficient. And the other the key thing here is that when you've got lots of kernels and lots of latency, you need to make your batch size really big to, in order to overcome the kind of the, the fixed cost of the latency and the writing back to memory and stuff. But if we minimize this, then we can we can get better performance with smaller batch sizes, which for a lot of um, applications is really important. So the first thing we're going to look at um, is training spike neural networks using a learning rule called EPROP. Um, Adam gave a great introduction to EPROP yesterday that I'm afraid I don't have the time to even try and compete with. But in short, we're trying to we're we're looking at this sort of class of problem here, where you have a spiking, you have some spiking inputs xt, and they're connected through a weight matrix Wn to a recurrent population of spiking neurons. And these are then connected through W out to a non-spiking population of output neurons. Um, the neurons in the recurrent population are using this adaptive lift, uh, this adaptive lift model. So you've got the normal kind of single, you've got the normal lift model. And then you have the second state variable with a longer um, time constant, which is subtracted from the, the threshold. And these neurons also have a relative reset. So rather than resetting the voltage right back to zero when they spike, you reset them by a fixed amount. You subtract a fixed amount from them. And as I say, these output neurons are non-spiking and they've got a trainable bias. And they generate an output um, pi kt, which is calculated from a softmax to the membrane voltage. And for classification problems, this is compared to the target labels, which is pi k t star. Um, the learning rule in these is a little complex. So this EPROP learning rule is used on the Win weights and the WREC weights. Um, and this, uh, this, this learning rule consists of, it's got three state variables. So you've got um, the epsilon eligibility trace, which feeds into the E eligibility trace. And these, um, this then leads to um, the delta, the, the weight change for, the, the, for each of these synapses. And this is calculated by multiplying this eligibility trace by the backpropagated error signal. So um, here, we, this BJK matrix can be a number of things. So it can be random, as Adam was talking about yesterday. But in our case, we use the transpose of W out, so which gives better performance. And in these, these uh, I'm not going to go into the details of these eligibility traces. There's two main terms to them, apart from a bunch of constants. You've got this uh, this psi JT term, which is the surrogate gradient of the postsynaptic neuron, and you've got the ZI the ZIT term, which is a filtered presynaptic activity. So it's basically a three-factor learning rule, three-factor learning rule with some kind of filtering business going on. Um, and in order to support problems like this, we've added some extensions to Gen. So now you can batch, you can do batching in the style of um, common machine learning frameworks, which means you can instantiate multiple copies of the model and you can share things like weights between these instances. We've also added this new kind of Swiss Army knife like tool called Custom Updates, which lets you define sort of arbitrary operations. So we often use these for implementing optimizers, stuff like Adam. Um, it also lets you efficient matrix transpose operations, so you can you can do this calculation of the exact transpose for feedback for feedback weights. And finally, it lets you do reduction, so you can take you can take things that are calculated on each element of the batch, like gradients, and you can sum them up and apply them to the shared weights. And this also extends across multiple GPUs, which I'll talk about in a minute. So to implement EPROP in this scenario, um, so this is an n batch simulation of this and each stimuli you're presenting for k time steps. So to, 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 to simulate this, we first of all launch a kernel to, sim, to update the membrane voltage and the adaption variable for each neuron. Then we launch another kernel to propagate all the spikes through the network. And finally, we launch a third kernel to um, update the, the eligibility traces and calculate the delta, the delta weights in each time step. So this is a continuous weight update, which, which is what kind of what makes this rule somewhat expensive. But after k of these time steps, we then run one of these custom updates to reduce the uh, to reduce the uh, gradients across the batches. Then we run another custom update to apply 
apply these to the weights with an atom optimizer, and finally we run a third to calculate the transpose of the output weights, and then we repeat back from the beginning. So we've, we've applied this, uh, we've applied this, this learning model to a few different data sets. First of all, the spiking Heidelberg digits, which are about 10,000 recordings consisting of 12 speakers speaking the digits 0 to 9 in English and German. And these are converted to 700 spike trains using an inner rear model. Um, so this is in, here we're comparing the accuracy of these, these, uh, class, these classifiers trained with EPROP to uh, classifiers trained with backprop through time uh, in this work here. So Zenker and Vogels in 2020 explored a whole bunch of architectures for this type of problem. Um, and in this the legend here, backprop through time is models trained through backprop through time. Um, FF means feed forwards and recurrent. RC means recurrent. So if we can see here in the first group, where we've got models with 256 neurons. Um, the feed forward models perform significantly worse. Um, however, with the recurrent recurrent configuration, so the orange network trained with backprop through time in PyTorch versus the um, the spiking network trained using Gen with EPROP, the performance is pretty close. So the difference between them is within, within the error bars. And as you increase the number of neurons in Gen, uh, you can beat this performance as obtained in PyTorch. So these, this is pretty competitive performance. Um, the next thing we looked at is how long it takes to train these models, because that's really important. That's one of the things we really want to start um, reducing. Um, and you can see that with a small model with 256 neurons, Gen is reasonably competitive. Um, PyTorch is slightly faster for a small number of time steps. But as you increase up to 1,370, uh, Gen becomes significantly faster, which is great. Um, sadly, this doesn't continue as you build models bigger um, and compete competing on sort of continuous updates with PyTorch is, seems like a little bit of a losing battle. Uh, so as you get larger models, uh, Gen becomes slower. However, because uh, EPROP has a much lower memory requirement than BackProp through time, we can simulate much larger models. So you can see where we're missing orange bars of PyTorch. This is because we're running out of memory. And this is on a 12 gig GPU. So it's, it's quite, quite a powerful GPU, but you still can't simulate a 512 neuron model um, for, you can't train a 512 neuron model on 1,370 time step stimuli. And this gets even worse with the 104 neuron model where you run out of memory by 685 time steps. And you could obviously reduce the batch size, but that wasn't the comparison we we're making. And all the PyTorch training was done by this code, using this code from Friedman Zenker, linked in the bottom. So this training can also, um, this training can also be done across multiple GPUs, as I said. So here we've shown the results on two different systems. One is a DGX box with, with eight v V100 cards. And you can see that, so the one V100 is one on this scale. When we, when we use all eight, we distribute the problem across all eight uh, GPUs. You get almost perfect scaling. So you almost get eight times the performance, um, which is great. And then we also looked at this, this uh, more modern system with A100 cards. So this system had four has four A100s in each node. So within one node, you also get pretty close to perfect scaling. Um, however, as you expand up to 32 to 32 uh, GPUs, so that's um, across eight nodes, the scaling gets a bit worse. And this is probably due to two different factors, both the cost of communication across the nodes, but also the fact that we use this as basically a strong scaling experiment. So um, we're looking, we're keeping the problem size the same. So the batch size is constant. And um, the, so the efficiency is getting worse on each node. That's one data set. We also looked at this um, spiking sequential MNIST data set, where rather than present, have one each neuron responsible for one pixel, instead you do this kind of raster scan across the, across the digit. And, when, and each neuron represents a threshold. So when you hit a pixel, the neurons that represent that threshold fire. So this is actually quite a tricky problem um, because you need to remember long... Um, a long sort of temporal relation. So if you the sort of you might need to remember stuff here when you're many, many pixels later in the scans. So this is quite a hard problem. Um, and it's and to compare we're here we're comparing the um, the performance of this classifier. So we're gen is the red bars and we're comparing this to both straightforward leak integrate and fire models trained with TensorFlow in green and LSTMs trained in TensorFlow in orange and um, a recurrent uh, adaptive adaptive lift neural network trained in TensorFlow in blue. Um, and you can see that here EPROP isn't quite as good, so, but we're still getting 90%. And this again, increases a bit 
as you as increase the number of neurons. So still we're getting reasonably competitive performance. Um, and these TensorFlow results are from this, this really cool preprint by uh, Planck et al. from last year, um, where they compared, compared these models on a variety of hardware. Um, and continuing to compare to their results, here we're comparing the inference performance. So we've looked at we've looked at classification performance, we've looked at training time, now we're looking at inference time. And here um, generally shines. So in this right hand side of the figure, we're showing how the inference time um, scales with batch size. So gen is faster than, so on the same GPU, gen is faster than TensorFlow simulating an STM across all batch sizes. Um, and the energy delay product we show in the bottom right is also better. Um, so these are really good results. Um, but also interestingly, the um, Planck et al. looked at um, looked at sort of looked at single using batch size one um, simulations on Loihi as well as the TensorFlow systems. And here we can see that in terms of pure pure latency, Gen is faster than Loihi um, and faster than most of the, both the TensorFlow results. TensorFlow is not intended for batch size one sort of low latency operations, which is a bit unfair. But I thought I'd include these anyway. Um, and here you can see actually that Gen is faster on the CPU than the GPU in this case. And this is because with batch size one, there's not really that much processing with, um, to do um, inference with an SNN. But this is still faster than Luihi in this case. Although from Mike Davies' talk the other day, I suspect this will no longer be the case with uh, Luihi 2. So on the bottom left, we're comparing the energy delay product. And again, Gen is better than the, uh, than the TensorFlow models. But as you might imagine, several orders of magnitude worse than Luihi system. So and now I'm going to go to the second part of this talk, which is work that Thomas has recently been doing. So we've been looking at implementing this, this event prop learning rule um, using Gen. So this, is, uh, this was developed by Timo Wunderlich and Christian Pelle uh, in 2021. And it's a great paper in scientific reports that I recommend reading. And uh, if you don't quite have the time for that, there's also an excellent YouTube video from the Snoofer conference last year where Christian talks, explains it very nicely, probably much better than I'm going to attempt to do. Anyway, the, the premise of this, the premise of the kind of framework for this learning rule is that we normally describe a sort of leaky integrating fire neurons with this, these type of differential equations. And quite often we use a sort of informal description of how the threshold condition affects the, uh, what happens at the, when the neuron crosses the, crosses the threshold. But you can treat this more formally as a hybrid system where, um, where there's a transition when the voltage crosses the threshold, which is this one here. And also they, they sort of narrow down the special condition a bit by saying the derivative can't be zero. So this means that the derivative has to be actually crossing the, crossing the line. It can't just be sort of cusping on it. And at these transition conditions, they then define, transi they then define con transitions. So they use this plus notation for the value of the state variable after the transition and the minus before. So you can see that well, after the transition, the voltage is reset to zero and the current gets the weight, the weight of the spike spike input added to it. So this is just describing a perfectly normal leaky integrant fire uh, model using this, this framework, so just to sort of try and make you understand the sort of, there's nothing magic going on, it's just sort of notation. And these models are trained within this loss framework, where the loss term is the, is the sum of a function of the spike times and the integral of another function of the voltages in the network over time. So you can make loss functions that, that are either voltage-based or spike time-based, um, to train these models, and the clever bit is that, as well as this forward system of different, of, uh, this forward hybrid system defining the the neurons, they define this this adjoint hybrid system, which also has two differential two differential equations def defining its continuous state variables. This is lambda v and lambda i. So these run backwards because this is this is still backpropagation through time. It's just an event based backpropagation through time. And um, again, they have transition conditions, and these transition conditions are uh, triggered by the, the spikes from the forward pass. So rather than using all the continuous state from the forward pass, they just use the spikes. And at these conditions, a complex jump is made in the, in the v-state variable. And at these, at these transitions, you also, you then, you can then use the lambda i state variable to update the, the loss with respect to each weight. So this is a, this is essentially a, this, this calculates exact backpropagated gradients, but in an efficient event-based way, which is really exciting for 
Neuroma for hardware and also really exciting for Gen because we spent we spent years optimizing this uh, all these sparse updates so we should we can do this really efficiently as I'm going to show. You. So implementing this was a bit of a uh, a bit of a puzzle which Thomas is, is still working on but we think we're getting close. Um, so here we're showing the end of the so we're showing the end of the first uh, the first stimuli presentation. So we've presented the stimuli for k time steps and during this time we've just updated the state variables. And propagate the spikes through the networks. Um, the only additional thing we've done is record the voltage, the V's and the I's at the spike times. And now, in the next, the next, well, the next stimuli is being presented. So between t equals k and t equals two k minus one, we also reverse, we also sort of double buffer the back, the backward pass at the same time. So while we're doing this, this forward pass, we also run this adjoint system backwards. So we update the, in the same way, we have a neuron kernel, which updates the lambda Vs and the lambda Is and propagates the, the spikes in reverse order from the previous, the previous stimuli and makes the way up, makes, sums up the, uh, the loss with respect to each weight. And so this, this continues throughout the second stimuli presentation. At the end, like with EPROP, we reduce these losses across the batches and we apply these to the weights of the atom optimizer. So you've got rid of all the continuous updates and you've got rid of the need to do a transpose at the end. So this is, this is kind of looking like a really efficient, really efficient uh, solution for something like Gen. And we haven't quite got this working on data sets like uh, the spiking hardware digits. So we've dropped back to the uh, latency encoded MNIST data set where basically you take MNIST digits. For each pixel, you threshold them. For the pixels above the threshold, you generate a spike based on the log of the intensity. So you end up with something like this, where you've got sort of spike raster over 100 milliseconds. Um, so here we're comparing the accuracy and the training time of, um, of this model. Simulate, so both trained with PyTorch um, using backprop through time, Gen using EPROP and Gen using EventProp, all using feedforward lift model. So this means that the, the EPROP implementation is slightly simpler, but it still has the same kind of computational properties. And you can see that the, basically all of the models perform very similarly for the, in terms of accuracy. They all get between 96 and 97%. Um, EPROP is a little bit worse. Uh, backprop time is a little bit better. Uh, and the nice thing to see is that with EventProp, as you increase the number of neurons, you also get improved performance. So by, with 200 neurons, you're matching the, the uh, backprop through time performance. And again, the backprop through time performances are coming from this um, Zenker and Vogels paper. Um, but for us, the really exciting thing is that the training performance. So as as you can, as we showed before, um, the the training performance of EPROP increases quite drastically with the number of neurons. So while it's faster than backprop through time for small networks, it's worse for big networks. Um, however, event prop is a sort of order of magnitude faster, and that stays pretty much constant throughout the however large you make the model. So this is really exciting. So we can really start training these models fast. Um, so that's really the end of my talk. I'd just like to talk a little bit about future directions. So there's some interesting simplifications to EPROP that um, Charlotte Frankel presented in her, um, her, her IS, ISSCC paper recently. And these could allow us to make um, EPROP event base two, which could really help the performance. Um, we'd also interested in applying both of, these, both of these learning rules to CNNs rather than just uh, densely connected models so we can start attacking some larger vision problems. Um, also, uh, Wolfgang Master's group has had some interesting successes with applying this deeper structural plasticity rule to, uh, to, to EPROP and BACPROP through times. So we'd like to incorporate that. And also, sort of at a sort of higher level, we're looking at integrating all this stuff into a new higher level front end library for Gen. So you can, you can build these models much more easily and train them and compare these approaches. Um, and just a couple of days ago, our sort of first first paper about this work has just come out. Um, I, James Turner, who gave a talk a couple of days ago, and uh, this is available in the new IOP Neuromorphic, uh, Neuromorphic Journal. And finally, we're interested in looking at FPGA acceleration for these problems. Okay, thank you very much for um, for listening. I, this, I'd like to thank everyone who supported this work at Sussex and my funders. And if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them.